good, uh, let's say, morning. I got a haircut and a new suit. Let's do this. Today we're talking about criticism and what it is exactly. And the best definition I can offer you when it comes to criticism is that criticism is a way of judging a uh, work and looking at its merits and faults. This is the most basic definition we can offer. The first thing that we need to do is look back in history and look at what uh, Ransom in particular is reacting to when we talk about criticism. Because you have to understand, criticism is was not practiced the same way its entire history. Uh, before the new critics who we're taking our inspiration from, this is not super important that you need to know this history or uh, the names of it, but more so how to practice it, uh, before they, they arose and sort of uh, reclaimed criticism, it was a very simplistic practice. Uh, you had people who reacted to texts in a moral uh, sort of religious way. They would say a work is blasphemous or a work is this or that. Um, that it expressed morals that they did not particularly agree with. A lot of times those people were basing their reactions off very little evidence. This is something we not, do not want to do. And the other side of the, the sort of more scientific approach at the time was to take uh, the history of the author. Right? The author was all important. So what they would do is they would say, okay, we have, here is the history of the author. This is the things that that person has done in their life. And here is the text. I like my, do you like my hand here? All right. So the text had to match the history of the author. That's how they did criticism. And that was basically all you needed to do. You said, here's this thing that happened in the author's life. Here's this thing that's similar in the text. We can match those two things up. And that's all we really need. Well, when you think about criticism in that way, it's very simplistic. It doesn't really offer a lot of interpretation. It almost is to the point where there is one specific answer, right? And when we're discussing literature, literature is subjective, right? There is no one specific answer. So Ransom and the New Critics are moving away from that approach. They're saying, we don't like this idea that there is only one answer. There are multitudes of answers, right? And we can sort of mine a text, look at a text, and discover them in exciting ways that weren't being practiced. So Ransom's approach is to make criticism more scientific. And you'll see that when you read, if you haven't already, Criticism, Inc. Now he sort of says uh, there are three people who should be qualified uh, to discuss literature, discuss art. He says there's first the, the critic himself or herself, but oftentimes, as we, we just mentioned, the critic really has a hard time uh, being objective, right? They're mostly subjective people. The next person that should be uh, a master of criticism is the artist, him or herself. But oftentimes, the artist or is really unsure what makes great art. They don't have an objective set of criteria that they can use to sort of pull meaning out of a text. And our last person, and probably the one that should know the best, but oftentimes doesn't, is the professor. Right? And Ransom says the professor is just offering complete garbage when it comes to criticism. So those are our typical critics and who we expect to be good at it. And he says that really none of them are, and there's a reason for that. It's not just one reason, but a multitude of reasons for uh, what people are doing with criticism. And he outlines a list in his article that he believes are things that are not criticism. And we're going to use them as well to be our guide to get us started. So the first in his list is personal registrations, right? Typically, this is where most of us start. We say when we watch a film that we liked it, right? If you ask us why we liked it, we say because it was exciting, because it made us cry, because it made us, you know, happy or laugh. These criticisms are not criticism. They're very simplistic. There is no real logic behind them. There's no 
if we want to use Ransom's term, no science. What are the criteria you're using that makes you say, it made me happy or made me sad? This is a very simplistic uh, sort of mode of criticism, and this is the th type of thing we need to start wor working away from. Uh, sort of leave that stuff behind. Uh, our first instinct is a good one. We should sort of say, you know, if we watch a movie and we like it, yes, you know, we're pro there's pro there are reasons why, and we need to find out what those reasons are. Uh, number two in Ransom's list is, as he puts it, uh, I think he, it's somewhat sexist in remark, he says, women's book club type criticism, which is paraphrase and summary. Right? This is a horrible way to do criticism, and I think it's what a lot of undergraduates end up doing in their papers uh, because they really don't know what else to do. Right? That's, it's because of ignorance, which is fine. That happens. Our goal is to move toward enlightenment and away from ignorance. So what people will do is they'll say, well, here are the events of this story, or here is what this poem says more or less, right, in terms of the actual things happening, and they don't offer any interpret this type of supposed criticism that Ransom singles out is linguistic studies. Uh, this is a little bit what we're doing, a little bit not what we're doing, uh, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, when we talk about, when he talks about ling linguistic studies, he's talking more about semantics, about arguments over what one particular word means, which is not really our goal. When we do close reading, and I think this we have, have to preface this with it, we're looking at the string of words, the phrases, the sentences, how those things combine to create meaning. That's the thing we're debating over, not the, the meaning of an individual word. So keep that in mind. Uh, Ransom's next example of what is not criticism is moral studies. And what he means by that is uh, sort of that old style of criticism I talked about already. When we talk about a text, we talk about a poem, sometimes they're going to uh, espouse a, a idea or a philosophy we may not agree with, right? Uh, if you watch a movie like The Dark Knight, for example, I'm sure most of you have seen it, there's some very serious questions that movie raises. I know it just seems like a typical Batman movie, but really that movie is about much more. It's about America post 9-11. And in that movie, there are a lot of moral quandaries for Batman. He has to make decisions that don't always seem black and white. They're not clear cut, right? If you look at that movie, and we'll just sort of do a quick analysis so that you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, there are a lot of things in it that are shot in a way to suggest or, or remind us of our memories of 9-11. Think about after Rachel dies and Batman is standing on the rubble of the building. That sh is shot in a very specific way to remind us of the firefighters and the people the first responders who were at ground zero and had to deal with that tragedy, right? Who had to recover the bodies and all of that. And there are a lot of things in Batman uh, in Dark Knight that are reminiscent of our modern day problems with terrorism, right? The Joker isn't a supervillain. He is a terrorist, right? He's got a philosophy. It's anarchy. It's different than the terrorism we fight today, but it's a very similar situation. And Batman had to make hard decisions. At the end of the film, he is tapping into every cell phone in Gotham. Now, if you think about it, right, uh, is there anybody in government doing that today? Absolutely, right? The NSA is tracking pretty much everything we do online. They're probably collecting data about this very video and our class. Um, this is something that Batman is doing himself, right? And it's mo morally a difficult choice, right? He, he is getting the Joker by doing this, but what is he giving up, 
right? And some people, now depending on what your interpretation of those events are, uh, may say that Bat uh, The Dark Knight is a very conservative film, that it support, supported at the time uh, the Bush administration's efforts on the war on terror, blah, blah, blah. If you're, if you're liberal, you might say it's the opposite, that it's uh, saying that that's bad, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it's really up to you on that choice. What is that film trying to say? Right, And I think people will be quick to dismiss something because it expresses a philosophy they don't agree with. If you're a liberal and you hear that conservative side, you're going to disagree with it. Well, it doesn't necessarily make the work bad, right? It's, we can quibble over that definition or that interpretation, that, that meaning. Um, and again, so again, just because we don't agree with the philosophy of a text does not make that text invalid. And our final one, uh, or I'm sorry, I missed one. My, my mistake, I missed one before we got to our final one, uh, that Ransom outlines is historical studies, right? That idea of matching the author's life with the text. Uh, especially in recent times, there has been sort of a new approach to history, what we call new historicism, um, but we're not going to practice really either of these things uh, until that final paper. I want you to be aware of it, that it exists out there, but using history to sort of support your argument isn't really the direction we want to go in just yet. It's a little more advanced, it's a little more difficult. But our goal right now is to sort of to imagine, and this comes from E.M. Forrester in his book Aspects of a Novel, that all of literature is in one room at the same time in history, right? Well, maybe not even the same time, but in some strange literary purgatory. And every writer is sitting in this room and they were all writing at the same time, right? So they're all writing at the same time and it's just a matter of happenstance that each work is produced at different times, right? So we sort of are trying to remove the history that is attached to these works. Now, in the case that I just gave with Dark, Dark Knight, obviously the history is important, and it's something that you'll have to keep in mind when you analyze a text, but we're not quite there yet, especially with the poetry. We don't want to do that just yet. So we're sort of distancing ourselves from that idea of the history is what matters. Also, we are removing the importance of the author. Because if we talk about The Dark Knight and say, well, Christopher Nolan made the film, and because he made the film, we can expect certain things, and he does this, he does that, it doesn't really matter. Because we're not there to analyze Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan doesn't matter, right? It's all that matters is the text itself. So we're sort of looking at things without bias or prejudice. We're looking at them, what is on the page? And that's sort of our starting point uh, when we talk about analyzing and critiquing literature. We're looking at the text itself by itself. Uh, there's a critic by the name of Roland Barth who later sort of developed this idea, and he calls it the death of the author. Now, the reason why he makes a big deal about the death of the author is because when we remove the author, or when we, let's back it up here, when we give a text an author, we're essentially imposing a limit on the possible meanings of that text. We're saying that, well, because the author obviously has an interpretation, they have a goal, they have an argument, they have a reason for writing. And when we look at the author as the sole or supreme interpreter of a text, really, why is there a point to have dissenting opinions, right? Why should there be diversity of opinion? The author, him or herself, is the one who can tell you what that work is about because they wrote it. Well, we are saying, no, that's not true. We don't want to fall in that trap. Right? Because authors can be misleading, they could be wrong, right? they could not know what they were writing about. So, it's a little more up for debate if we remove the author and we remove the history. And then, again, the final 
uh, study here is any other special study that looks at things outside of the text, right? These, we are going to divorce te the text from history and essentially the world and look at them on their own merits. That's our starting point. We're divorcing art from its context and we're starting with the work itself. So how essentially can we perform criticism with only the work, right? Because we need the author, we need all of these other things. Well, not necessarily. This is where this idea of close reading uh, comes in and the ideas expressed in my article and Eliot's tradition in individual talent. So let's start with the most obvious, right? If we have a collection of words on the page, we can start there. Essentially, what is that text communicating line by line, prose, uh, the words themselves? And we use this technique of close reading in order to do that. So it's a little complicated to explain close reading. The best example I can give you uh, is going to be the uh, poetry close reading, which you'll find on web study. There is a uh, an example poem with uh, some footnotes and a lot of explanation on how how we do that process. But I'll tr sort of try to explain it to you here in the video in uh, in shorthand. So we have a line of poetry, right? We have uh, let's say it's three four words, right? Those three four words all individually mean something, right? They all have a specific meaning. If you go in the dictionary and look up those words, you'll find a meaning, right? And by themselves, they're really meaningless, right? They don't really do anything on their own. But if we take one word, right? Here's one word. And then have a word that follows it, we begin to create meaning. This is called difference and difference. The reason why this is important is because the second word defers the meaning of the line, right? And it differs from the previous word. Now, a lot of times you're going to end up looking at two words together and it's not going to be very meaningful. It might be an infinitive to do something. Uh, it may be a verb in an article. It may be an article and a noun. But when you start to add them together, maybe a full sentence or a full phrase, now we can start to slowly sort of extract meaning from those lines. And that's our first starting place. We can do that very easily, right? We can say, we can look at that collection of uh, words and phrases and sort of uh, explicate meaning from them. Now, the second way we can sort of look at a text and analyze it without history, context, blah, 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 uh, to an extent is what Eliot's talking about in tradition and individual talent. What he's saying there is all of literature stems from a tradition. Now, I know this sounds like it may be getting to the idea of history, but not necessarily. It all stems from a tradition. And what, what do we mean by tradition? Well, all literature has a particular form, particular expectations that we sort of put on them. Uh, these are what we call conventions, right? Things that make a text or a form a form. Poetry has line breaks. Poetry has rhymes. Poetry has rhythms, right? These are all conventions of poetry. Things like metaphors, similes, irony. Uh, in the case of stories, we have plot, we have structure, we have characters, we have dialogue, we have narrative. All of these things are part of a tradition, right? And we're looking typically how well does that author adhere to that tradition, right? If a story is good, well, typically we realize that it's good because it plays into our expectations of what a story should do. It has a status quo, it has rising action, it has a denouement, so on and so forth. But, and this is the important point that Eliot makes, the other thing that we have to recognize is that individual talent. Fiction, in particular, and poetry as well, and drama, but we'll stick with fiction for a moment. Fiction is all about uh, sort of changing up 
our expectations. We, when we watch a action film, there are certain things that you see have seen in almost every action film, every time you watch it. Uh, there's a fire apparently. Uh, I don't. I just want to point that out if that's coming in on the video. But every time you watch an action film, you see the same events, right? Maybe the there's a scene where the hero's girlfriend is captured, right, and he has to go to save her. Or, you know, there's these little situations that creep up again and again, right? And you recognize them. There are lines that are almost verbatim in all these different movies, in these same situations. Things like that, right? This is the part of the tradition that Elliot is saying we have to get away from. We don't want to do everything the same as the people before us. We have to play with the form in some way. And that's sort of his definition of what makes great art. It's adhering to the tradition and revolting against it all at the same time. Um, so those are our ways of looking at a text and sort of what we're left with. This is where you're starting from in your uh, forum posts. This is where you're going to want to start sort of coming up with that criteria. That's pretty much it for this week. Make sure you read all of the readings, uh, the article by me, Ransom, T.S. Eliot, and the short piece on uh, close reading to sort of get you thinking about this. Um, and take your time and really think about the question being asked on how do we do criticism when we sort of remove all the things that we are used to doing when we talk about criticism. Um, you may want to give some examples of what would that what that would look like or how you would do it. Um, be specific on what criteria. You know, you may even want to do it in list form uh, of what things make good art good art. Because this is going to be your guide, especially for your papers. Um, and hopefully we'll sort of see your knowledge and your ability expand over the course of the semester. So keep up with the readings. Uh, do your forum posts, and until next time, peace.